This episode may contain sensitive language not suitable for children. Hello, and welcome back to Season 2 of Through Black Eyes and Filtered the podcast that brings truth to light. Listen to present-day historical events that shaped our history and will determine our future. It's presented by moderator Raymond Dunn and expert Marvin Dunn. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn, and I'm the author of two children's storybooks. My first storybook is The Little Scrub Christmas Tree. It's the story of a little tree that finds itself growing up in a Christmas tree forest. In the story... I have embedded many lessons that young children might learn that will help them as they mature. My second book is The Robin That Could Not Sing. And this is the story of a little bird that tried very hard to be like all of the other birds. And there are also lots of lessons involved in this book that young children might pick up as they read the story that will help them in their everyday lives and other obstacles that might come their way. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn. I'm Dr. Marvin Dunn. And I will serve as your moderator for Through Black Eyes Unfiltered. I will be your commentator. In this episode four, we will talk about prominent Miami historical figures. And I would like to now welcome Dr. Marvin Dunn again. Thank you. We will pick this up. Okay. Dr. Dunn, let's talk first about Dr. William B. Sawyer. Who was he? Dr. Soy was one of the first black physicians in Miami. He was not the first, but he was among the first black physicians. He became um, a very successful doctor. Uh, Dr. Sawyer delivered a lot of black babies in Miami. A lot of folks <laughs> can um, identify their roots as having been um, delivered by Dr. William B. Sawyer. Uh, he became uh, very well to do. He built the Mary Elizabeth Hotel uh, in Overtown. I didn't know that. Yeah. And... Um, uh, was just a very prominent figure. Uh, in those days, um, black visitors to the city, uh, entertainers and sports figures, couldn't stay in white hotels. So there was a significant political and in- financial incentive to uh, building black hotels in Cutter Town. Dr. Sawyer built um, a very, very successful one. Through his um, prominence in the community, uh, became recognized as one of the persons that the white people went to to understand what was going on in the black community. And the Sawyer family became among the black elite of Miami. Miami had a very uh, definable social class among black people during those days. And there was a black elite, and the Sawyers were among them. About what year are we talking about? 1930s okay. into 1940s. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a very famous picture of uh, Dr. William B. Sawyer shaking the hand of Joe Lewis, the brown bomber, the wor- uh, world heavyweight champion. But um, similar pictures could have been made with many people who came to the hotel and w- stayed there during this time period. And one of the important things about Dr. William Sawyer was his daughter, Gwendolyn Sawyer Cherry, who became the first black woman to be elected to the Florida House of Representatives in the 1970s. But the family was very, very well established uh, by that time, I was able to interview uh, Dr. Sawyer's son, William B. Sawyer Jr., and his wife on several occasions in, in Overtown. They still live there. And they, among other things, of course, talked about the heyday and how things were great in Overtown back in the day. And then, Ray, they said something to me that I found interesting, a little bit disturbing, and just hadn't appreciated. Uh, Bernice Sawyer, uh, now this is now the uh, uh, the daughter-in-law of William B. Sawyer, the daddy. This is her, his son's wife, William B. Sawyer Jr., uh, who told me, you know, Dr. Dunn, uh, what really ruined us was integration. She said, uh, we were doing very well, and a number of other black businesses in Color Town over time, we're doing very, very well. And then integration came in, and uh, black people didn't have to stay at the Mary Elizabeth. They could stay at the Fountain Blue on Miami Beach. Mm. They could stay at any white hotel that would uh, would allow it. And so the same thing applied to black restaurants in Color Town and other businesses that operated that had previously served just the black community. Now black folks could spend their money any place they wished to. And she made the point that that's what killed the black elite. And I, I thought that not well, literally, but in terms of their economic prowess, was really damaged by black integration. And, and I thought that what really drove the nail into the heart of the black business community was Interstate I ninety five. Well, I ninety five was a later impact mm-hmm. on Color Town, but Color Town was in decline 
even before the uh, interstate was put through. The interstate was put through in the mid to late 1950s, at least right. the decision to put it through. Overtime was made after 1955 or so, so the interstate came in in the late 50s. But overtime was on decline by that time anyway. A lot of people had been moved out to Liberty City and displaced elsewhere. And it was a big problem going even back earlier than that. Well, I, I certainly uh, remember uh, during the heyday of overtime when they had the uh, Clyde Killings had, had his night beat over there. I mean, that was the place to be. But Cl- I think he was the manager of the, of the well, nightclub. Uh, well, he may have been. Uh, we, we, all we knew was Clyde Killings. We, did, we really didn't but know. My point, those, those night, the, the nightclubs in Overtown, during the heyday of Overtown, were all owned by white people. And we didn't know that. We didn't know. Clyde Killings was the, the, the face of it, mm-hmm. but the, the, there were white folks on the beach who owned those clubs, okay. to, to be honest about it. And they made a lot of money in the process. Okay, okay. But let me, just, let me just connect with Dr. Sawyer and, and his daughter, just right. just to move forward with Gwen. Yeah, because that's the, what I was yeah. going to ask you to do. I'm right. sure you were, bro. Go ahead. I might as well jump right to it. The Sawyers had a daughter, Gwendolyn Sawyer Cherry. Um, uh, um, now we're talking 19, in terms of her becoming a prominent person in the 1970s and so. And she managed to be elected to the Florida House of Representatives. And this is after the, the liberal expansion of blacks in Miami and more liberal um, attitudes of the white community in, in the 1960s and 70s. So she gets elected. We all knew her. They were proud of Gwen Cherry. Um, she fought the fight. One night, she was uh, going to a meeting in Tallahassee. And she took a shortcut in her car across the campus of uh, Florida a and University. And her car went into a ditch, broke her neck, and she died. And um, Carrie Meek took her seat in the Florida House of Representatives, and that's how Carrie started her political career. But that was the end of Gwen Cherry, this very tragic, way, way early death of a person who had right. come from a very prominent family who knew how to help black community and, and who indeed did help the black community during those days. And our young listeners may... Uh, know of the Gwen Cherry Park right mm-hmm. there on 17th Avenue and about 71st Street and somewhere mm-hmm. in there. Uh, I remember uh, many years after her death, uh, most of the black political rallies were held there. Mm-hmm. What was that guy's name? Charles Hadley? And, uh, no, Papa Charlie Hadley, yeah. yeah all, all, yeah. Almost all of the, the yeah. black politicians well, held their rallies in the, Gwen Let's Cherry talk Park. about Papa, uh, Papa Charlie Hadley. Okay. Um, but um, Charles Hadley was a political activist in Liberty City. He was a huge man, very fat <laughs> guy, wore suspenders a lot. Mm-hmm. He operated something called Operation Big Vote, mm-hmm. which was the first political machine that delivered the black vote. Similar to the Chicago machine, right? It, same, same thing. Yeah, yeah, if, exactly. if, you're, if you're running for office, you had to go to Charlie Hadley and get his approval, and he would deliver Operation Big Vote for you. Howard Gary was his nephew. Howard Gary became the first black city manager of the city of Miami. That was Uncle Charlie's nephew. So I just want to make the point that you, by, by the 1960s, you now have enough black activism in politics to be able to deliver the black vote to somebody. It can't be done anymore these days. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also want to mention, since we mentioned Gwen Cherry being the first black uh, woman to serve in the Florida House of Representatives, Let's also not forget to mention Joe Lang Kershaw. Exactly. The first black male, the first black man to serve in the Florida House of Representatives since Reconstruction. Uh, Joe, Joe Lang was, was a coach, right? A football coach. He was a, a Dade County school system teacher. I think he taught social science, social studies in the school Joe system. Lane. And Joe got himself elected to the Florida House of Representatives, first black man to be elected since Reconstruction. Now, that was really something. He, he was quite was a really character. Something. Well, thank you very much for all of that, that history. Uh, tell us about John O'Brown. Dr. John O'Brown was the head during the civil rights uh, movement in Miami in the 60s and 70s. Dr. John O'Brown was the president of CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality, the most activist of the civil rights organizations. They did most of the demonstrations and marches. Uh, the NAACP had a much less aggressive approach to social change. They really did their work through the, the legal system. They did a lot of challenges in court um, of uh, uh, Jim Crow laws and what have you. But uh, John O'Brown uh, was a army officer. He was a captain in the army. Uh, he was an ophthalmologist, doctor, and he came from uh, Oklahoma, the Black Seminole Reservation in Weewoka, Oklahoma. He was stationed in Miami during the Second World War and decided to stay here and became active. Dr. Brown told me that he could not believe how racist Miami-Dade County was when 
He settled here in the early late 1940s, and he said that um, one of the reasons he stayed was because he felt that after being in the war, serving as a, as a soldier in the war, as a doctor in the war, that um, he had a duty to try to change the situation that he saw in Miami. So Dr. John O'Brown was um, a very instrumental figure in forcing white people to recognize that change had to come. He was also a black Seminole. He was a descendant of the black Seminole tribe in Oklahoma who settled in Miami. Mm, okay. Dr. John O'Brown. I, I really didn't know very much. I didn't know anything uh, about him. Thank you very much for that. Someone I am familiar with, but I would like to get uh, more information on is Father Theodore Gibson. Oh, Father Gibson. <laughs> Father Gibson was the second black person to serve on the Miami City Commission. <laughs> He was the pastor of the, the Venerable Christ Episcopal Church in Coconut Grove, huge pink church, the biggest black church in Coconut Grove, a Bahamian population in that church for the most part. And uh, Gibson in the 1950s, actually in the 1940s, became very politically active. He was one of the black men whose family was involved in the desegregation of the school system. Gibson's son was one of the children who was named in the lawsuit, forcing the school system of Dade County to desegregate. And as I said, he was also later on the Miami City Commission. We just refer to him as father. So in, in, in the community, if you said, well, I'm going to go see Father, we knew who you were going to go see. It was going to be Father Gibson. I, I, got, I got to ask you this. Is it true that if you got on Father Gibson's wrong side, he would cuss you out? Gibson would cuss you out from the from the <laughs> deist in the city commission meeting. I was sit, I went to commission meetings, and particularly the police and the sanitation department mm. heads had a lot of trouble for Father Gibson because Gibson his first question out of his mouth with whatever got presented to that city commission was how does this affect black people or well, he would put it how does this affect my people and if you can explain how this particular proposal or this particular budget item impacted in a positive way the black community. You didn't get Gibson's vote. I went to city commissions. I don't go anymore, but I used to go to city commission meetings and um, would sit back and listen to Gibson take on these uh, officials coming before the commission. They weren't used to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Range didn't do that. Mrs. Range fought her battles in a, in a different kind of way. Diplomatically. Yeah. But Gibson's because you're behind out. If you came up there with something shaky, Father would tell you what he thought about you. I, 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 I met with Gibson once and said, Father, I mean, this is just you and me in your office. <laughs> How can you cuss like that? <laughs> oh, they make me mad enough, Doc. I'll, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell them what I think. And he did. Father Thelma Gibson, his, his wife who survives him, a very prominent woman in Coconut Grove. Um, she was one of the first black nurses that was allowed to practice at Jackson Hospital. Oh. And I, I think she also was at Christian Hospital for a while. But Thelma Gibson was among, I don't want to get my facts mixed up here, but I know that she was one of the first black women uh, registered nurses who was able to practice in, in Dade County. Whether it was that Jackson or Christian Hospital, I'm not sure. It may have, may have been both of that I know. Okay, well, we we mentioned some of Father Gibson's accomplishment in our previous episode because I had it mixed up with someone else. So let's just set the record straight. Would you set the record straight about Father's, Father Gibson's involvement and the way it in and in his relationship uh, with the uh, philanthropist? Set the record straight for us. Well, let's uh, start with uh, Virginia Key Beach. When the, the Second World War started, a lot of military activity bases were established in, in Florida because of the weather allowing the military to train people here year-round. And the Navy uh, had a, a base, downtown Miami, other facilities as well, and uh, needed a place to teach uh, their recruits to swim. So Dade County was not Miami-Dade County then, but Dade County allowed the Navy to use Crandon Park, public beach, to train white sailors to swim but the county would not allow the Navy to take black sailors out to Grandin Park, it was a white beach. Now, we're talking 1945, 44, 43 as the war moved along. But the county allowed um, the Navy to use a little spit of land called Virginia Key to take colored sailors to teach them to swim. The war is over, the Navy leaves, and the county takes control of the beach back. And Father Gibson, John O. Brown, and some others that could be mentioned, uh, most of them were vets. Father Gibson was not a veteran, but John Brown was, and some of the other people out there with him were vets. And these were people who'd come back from the World War looking to be treated like human beings, equal treatment. And here they couldn't go to the beach in Miami and took on this as a challenge. So when the uh, Navy left Virginia Key Beach and the county and the, and the county was asked by these uh, black leaders to allow it to be a colored beach, they weren't asking to integrate Crandon Park. They were not trying to integrate the white beaches, like Hollowville Beach up in North Dade. They just wanted to have a colored beach. And the county said no. 
They're not doing that. So Gibson, John Brown, Brown, and some others, and black men, got together, and they did a wade-in at a white beach, Hollowood Beach, mm-hmm. 1945. This is before the Civil Rights Movement started. And uh, they went up there and waded into the, into the water. The police were called. They weren't arrested. A day or two after that incident, they went back to the county commission, and the county commission allowed Virginia Key Beach to be open so that they would avoid future confrontations like that. I think people listening to this should realize that the Civil Rights Movement is given credit for having begun in North Carolina among college students there. But the Civil Rights Movement really be- began in Miami. The Congress on Racial Equality was having training sessions on nonviolent techniques in Miami in the late 1950s. Even before we saw the jump off of the civil rights movement, there were things happening in Miami in the 1940s in mm-hmm. terms of civil rights activism, including the attempt to try to use the public golf courses mm-hmm. because the, the city would not allow black golfers, you're a golfer, so this is I mean, something to you and your, your friends, but if you're a black golfer, the city would not allow you to use Mel Reese golf course that the city owned. Exactly. And Gibson and, and some others, John Brown and others, challenged the city on this, and guess what the city did to compromise for the black golfers? The first thing that they did was they gave us, the black golfers, one day in the week that's that right. golfers could start using it. Right. And it was the day that the greens were being watered. It, exactly. <laughs> when they were working on, on, on the greens and the fairways, that was the day that the black golfers could use it. And most of the black golfers who were using it back then were the caddy. Uh, now, you had prominent blacks who were golfers, but that's, that's when we could use it, that one day a week. And Gibson uh, went on to do a, a, a number of important things. Oh, no, hold on, hold on. But before we leave completely uh, Virginia Beach, uh, let, let, me, let me bring the personal family history in here. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell our audience where all of the Dunn brothers learned to swim. <laughs> well, some of us learned better than others to swim, <laughs> but those of us, uh, of us who did learn to swim, learned to swim, did so at Virginia Key Beach. Virginia Key Beach. Like a lot of other folks listening to this um, can remember, that's where you had to go. You know, Ray, at that, when we were kids coming up, we're talking now 1950s in Miami-Dade County, the state of Florida had um, two highway patrol cars parked on that bridge going over from Virginia mm-hmm. Key to Crandon Park. That's as far as you could on, go. Yeah, 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 right. Unless you were made and could show that you worked on Key Biscayne on the weekends, you couldn't cross that, that causeway. Okay. Let's be off topic just for a minute since you Would, Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> You're right about that. Since, we, since you mentioned ID cards, just give a quick summary about mom's ID card. I know mm. it had to do with, mm. with being a maid. But, yeah. uh, but not with Virginia Key. Yeah. But just talk about yeah. you know, needing ID cards to access Miami Beach. Our mother was a maid uh, for some years on, on Miami Beach. I still have her ID card. I, I know you have. In order to work as a maid on Miami Beach, the Miami Beach Police Department issued you a, a an ID card with your fingerprint on it, your thumbprint on it. And that was your, at your uh, access to Miami Beach. Uh, you have to show that card. But what I found particularly insulting about that was that they would take your fingerprint based upon the assumption that you were a thief. So that if something was stolen, they now have a way to track down the, the, the person that they, would thought, that they thought might have taken it. And that suspicion normally fell upon the black folks who worked on these estates. Maids and gardeners were assumed to be thieves, so you had to have some way of policing and keeping up with uh, these people working on the, on the beach. Since we're already off topic, then it was, is it true that during that time that the rule of thumb or the signs were uh, no blacks and Jews on Miami Beach after dark? And if you had that ID card, you had to get over on the mainland before sundown? Well, Miami Beach was a sundown town. Um, any town in Florida that has the name Beach in it, it was a sundown town, meaning that, a, uh, meaning black people could not be there after the sun went down. And Miami Beach was a sundown town. Mm-hmm. I don't know that there was ever a sign that said blacks, no blacks, no Jews on Miami Beach. I've heard that there was such a sign, but I never saw it. Uh, but certainly the spirit of the time mm-hmm. was that, talking now 1930s and mm-hmm. into the 40s, that they did not want blacks on Miami Beach or Jews on Miami Beach and during those times. Okay, back on topic. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's go to a personal friend of ours as we grew up somewhat together. Uh, 
federal judge, district judge, Wilkie E. Ferguson. Tell us about Wilkie. Wilkie is one of my heroes. As a matter of fact, uh, he, he, yeah, he grew up with us in Opelika. Of course. Uh, Wilkie Ferguson, uh, uh, who became a federal judge, um, rode the school bus to, <laughs> to the black schools down in Liberty City, just as we had to from North Dade. Wilkie became a federal judge. He had been a district judge. Judge, court judge before that, and eventually became, and then became an appellate court judge and then a mm-hmm. federal judge. But what's important about Wilkie Ferguson is that he was on the appellate bench when the 1980 riot took place. And Wilkie Ferguson was the judge who drafted the opinion of the third appellate court on the composition of the jury that heard that trial. Let me just back up just a little mm-hmm. bit. The 1980 riot occurred in Miami because a black man had been was beaten to death by five or six white police officers in Miami-Dade County. Uh, give, give us his name, McDuffie. So Arthur McDuffie was his name. This happened in December 1979. The result of that beating, McDuffie's death, led to a riot in 1980 when the officers, the white officers who were involved in that were acquitted in Tampa. Mm-hmm. The reason that we had that riot, right, one of the reasons, the main reason, and I think was that the trial of these officers was held by all uh, by an all white jury, and what. Wilkie Ferguson did in the aftermath of that riot was to be the person who, the judge who drafted the the rule of the court in Florida that you could not exclude people from serving on the jury just because they were black, which is why the McDuffie jury was an all black, oh no, it was an all white jury because in those days a lawyer could excuse someone, a certain number of people on the jury, uh, just based on anything they wanted to, including color. And Wilkie Ferguson was um, a part of the uh, legal establishment that stopped the use of what was called the peremptory challenge to remove people from jury service uh, based on race. And had that rule been in in effect when the McDuffie trial took place, it would not have been heard by an all-white jury. Mm -hmm. And that may have been a deterrent to the riot that resulted. Mm -hmm. The federal courthouse is named uh, after Judge Judge Ferguson. Ferguson. And his uh, wife, Betty Ferguson, Mm -hmm. became a Miami-Dade County Commissioner Commissioner. after some years. Exactly. And we now have a community center in the Miami Gardens area named after his wife, Betty Ferguson. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Let's talk about Dr. Johnny L. Jones. You know, I, you knew Johnny better than I know the history of Johnny Jones. And you know, yours. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, wait, wait, just since we're going to talk about Johnny, uh, can we can we give a shout out to KASI and the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity? Come there, on. There now. may be some Omegas and Kappas who would, and the Sigmas who may not be all happy about that. Well, they'll just have to accept that. A shout out to Kappa Alpha Psi. You know, the public view is that Don, Johnny L. Jones was the first black superintendent of Dade County Public Schools. Mm-hmm. Right, he was. No, he was not. Oh, he was not? He was, he was not. That was a black superintendent of Day County Schools. Okay, that was black superintendent of Day <laughs> County Schools when? During Reconstruction in 1870s. Oh, okay. In the 1870s, when the Civil War was won by the North, and the North was in a position during Reconstruction to put black people in power all over the South, that was a black man appointed as the superintendent of schools for the county, not the colored schools of the county, of the schools for the county, and there was also a black man appointed as county commissioner. And really, Ray, it was a sham. The man, the man who was appointed superintendent of schools couldn't read or write, but he was being used by the North, by the carpetbaggers, as they were called, mm-hmm. to be put into power so that they'd have somebody they could manipulate to have the county and the school system run the way that they wanted to. So we had two black officials who were in office, but they were essentially powerless. It was really William Gleason, a carpetbagger from the North, who really sort of was in charge of the county that put these people in power. But Johnny Jones becomes appointed to the thing out to the Dade County the superintendent, school superintendency much, much later. We're talking 1960s. 70s now with Johnny. All right. Uh, now, in terms of his personal history, you know about as much as I do about yeah. about that. Johnny was uh, Johnny's degree uh, was in English, and uh, Johnny was a teacher, of course, for a long time. I think his first school was right there on right off of uh, 62nd Street. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Uh, Drew. Drew. Uh, yeah, Charles R. Drew Jr. <laughs> We're all so proud, those of us who knew Johnny, and of course he was our fraternity pole mark at the time, so we all ran in that same circle, but we're all proud of Johnny and and uh, being appointed as the principal there. And he did a heck of a good job. And from there, as we all know now, Johnny moved right up the ranks and became superintendent. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the uh, impressive things that Johnny did is as he moved up the ranks, and especially when he became a superintendent, Johnny pulled other blacks up by the bootstraps. You had a number of blacks who were brought into the 
Dade County District Office, you had a number of blacks who were appointed principals of senior high schools. And remember now, some years prior to Johnny, as we went through the whole desegregation of the Dade County Public School System, many black principals of predominantly black high schools that we'll talk about in another episode were dismissed, given desk jobs. No, not many, all of them. All of them, are, <laughs> except one, because my in Northwestern, they, they were not able to uh, to actually desegregate that the way that they did all the other predominantly okay. black all schools right. because of where it was located. But, the, uh, but anyway, let, let's, let's move on from that. But Johnny, Johnny helped a lot of blacks to move up in, in, the, in the ranks, and um, we're all proud of him for that. The other thing that I think people really don't know about Johnny is Johnny was talented in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, Johnny was a cook. <laughs> we would meet at Johnny's house, and Johnny would have fixed up uh, some kind of sausage or, or whatever. I don't know. He, he fixed all sorts of stuff. Um, and um, at one point, uh, after he was no longer superintendent, he was considering opening uh, his own uh, brand of breakfast sausage and all sorts of stuff. And, and he opened a, a restaurant eventually once, yeah. once he left the superintendent's thing. Yes. Uh, yeah, he opened <laughs> a, a, a restaurant right off right off of Biscayne Boulevard. Yep. Uh-huh. And uh, it was a very popular spot. Back then, you had this group of blacks that uh, who met, uh, I think they met once a month right on 7th Avenue. I forget the name of, of the restaurant. At Lums. Johnny was in that group. Dewey Knight Jr. was in that group. Uh, a lot of black Miami leaders uh, whose names you might know uh, were in that group. But th- those guys met to try to make things better for black people. Many of them were entrepreneurs, but they were not necessarily meeting to enhance their businesses. And I know, as Johnny explained it to us, uh, you know, little peons like me, we, we couldn't attend those meetings. But Johnny would come back in and tell us uh, what they were trying to do. Very impressive. He's now superintendent of, of public schools. It was a tough battle for him to get that job, but job, he eventually becomes superintendent and then gets involved in what became known as, and all the things Ray just mentioned, Johnny Jones indeed did that. He stopped outdoor suspensions. It was one of the big, Johnny Jones, the superintendent, said you cannot just put kids on the streets just suspending them out of school just to get them out of your hair. So the school system had to move to some sort of indoor suspension program so the kids weren't just put out on the streets. Johnny said, how, how can a child learn if you put him out in the streets? Okay, you got a child in school. He's, he's presenting a discipline problem. So you kick him out. You tell him you got a week's suspension. But what do you think he's going to do out there week. on the street for the week? Well, he comes back, he's going to do the same thing because hey, yeah. he's been having a ball. So he, he, he stopped all of that. He, he, he made a very big difference in that. And then uh, uh, the downslide in his life. Uh, the gold plumbing uh, fiasco. Tell gold, us about that. It, a report emerged in the, I guess, late 1970s, maybe 78 or 79, that the superintendent Johnny Jones had been involved in a scheme to buy plumbing, gold-plated plumbing, for a home that he was having built, a vacation home in Naples, Florida. The evidence of this was presented to the school board and eventually to the to the prosecutors that that um, the fixtures that he had ordered for his home in Naples were the exact replica of of um, the exact measurements of fixtures that were being ordered for one of the alternative schools to use in a training program to train kids to become plumbers. Mm-hmm. And uh, the charge was that he was misusing the funds from this school to buy plumbing for his home. And um, he was tried for this. It became an important trial that almost everybody in Dade County over the age of 15 watched and listened to and was convicted of this uh, attempted theft. And that began the downslide of Dr. Jones and his career as an educator. He had other problems after that, and uh, an auto accident that ended up not his fault, as it turned out, with the death of a child. His car um, ran into a building, a, a home. But again, he didn't end up being charged with that. Other charges of uh, using money emerged, and he just got so involved in these various legal issues that his life and his career was ended, his life as an educator. He left the system, and as we mentioned earlier, opened up a restaurant, mm-hmm. among other things that he tried to do, and eventually um, he passed away. I've mm-hmm. gotten the year, you probably know the year that the Dr. Jones passed away. We, we all uh, loved and admired and respected um, Dr. Jones and um, his wife and 
his daughter Johnny were all uh, very close to all of us. And um, we know that, that some of these things that you just talked about uh, happened, they were unfortunate. But for many of us, we hold Johnny Jones in high esteem. All right. Okay, I appreciate you talking about Dr. Jones, Wilkie Ferguson, uh, Theodore Gibson, Johnny O. Brown, Gwen Cherry, and William B. Sawyer. Thank you very much, Marvin. I will be more than happy to uh, discuss other leaders and uh, pro- prominent black Miami leaders in another episode. Well, let's talk about my book before we go. Well, that, <laughs> I wrote a book on Black Miami. I want to encourage people to, it's in the library. Let's talk about that. It's also available on Amazon. The book is entitled Black Miami in the 20th Century, which covers the period of 1896 until 1980, the riot. Uh, but the book is available on, Am- on Amazon. I recommend people to pick it up. I tried to tell the story of black people in Miami from the very beginning of the city up through the 1980s. And it's the first, this was the first comprehensive book on the history of black people in Miami-Dade County. I also did a book on the Miami Riot. It's available also in the library. It's called The Miami Riot of 1980, and Mm -hmm. I recommend people take a look at that, too. Okay, and while they're reading your adult reading, I hope that they will find time to pick up a book for their children. Um, Christmas season will be rolling around soon, and you can check out my book, The Little Scrub Christmas Tree, which is also available on Amazon. And by the time this program airs, you can also get my second book, The Robin That Could Not Sing. And it will also be available on as an audio book. Thank you very much. And we will close this session of Through Black Eyes Unfiltered. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Aris Crown All Natural Products and Clockwork Tracks for providing our podcast music. Special thanks also to our editor, Track 53, as well as HGAB Studios and MRD2 Media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at TBE Unfiltered, or go to our website at tbeunfiltered.com. And when you do, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. See you next week. Mm-hmm.